All right, we'll get started. Hello, everyone. Great. And my co-chair for this session is Rebecca Gao. We're chairs for session one, sediment deposition and tectonics from multiple, multiple perspectives. I think I got muted for a second there. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, uh, we're chairs for session one, sediment deposition and tectonics from multiple perspectives. So we'll get started. Uh, each talk should be 15 minutes in length. And at two minutes left, one of uh, the chairs here will indicate that the time is ending. The audience is welcome to type in questions in the chat or in the Q&A box in the control panel, and we'll bring them up at the end of the talk. If we don't have time for questions at the end of each talk, we recommend that the speakers stay the length of the session and uh, be available during the break to field any unanswered, unanswered questions. Students will need to vote for the best talk. A Qualtrics site has been set up for this and you can find the link on the Master Saturday website. Please vote for the best talk after the session is over. Our first speaker is James Hooker Guerin and I would like to invite his mentor to introduce him. Yes, thank you, George. So James Guerin, uh, it's a native of Maryland, and he moved to Texas here and did his undergraduate uh, in geology. Uh, then he worked uh, for his master's into beautiful outcrops into Uinta Basin on uh, Green River, where he will show us uh, now his results. And then uh, next, he will go to continue to work uh, on his PhD studies in, in Indiana. So Jake, you're on. OK, great. Um, can everyone see the screen? I think so. And uh, I'll get started. OK, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jake Guerin, and I'm a student in the Dynamic Stratigraphy Group, advised by, uh, as you saw, Cornell Lariu and Ron Steele. So for the past two years, uh, the taxpayers of Texas have been gracious enough to let me think about lakes and lake stratigraphy while I TA. So I'll hopefully demonstrate that it was all worth it. So I'm gonna quickly outline the main thrusts of this presentation. Firstly, something that may seem obvious, but actually causes a lot of issues in sedimentary interpretation. And that's that lakes and oceans are very different systems and they should be treated as such. And we shouldn't use conventional sequence stratigraphy to interpret them, and I'll go into that later. I'll present the largest to date cross section of the Eocene Sunnyside Delta interval of the Middle Green River formation uh, in the Uinta Basin, which shows more depositional variability than previous interpretations. Uh, I'll propose a new sequence stratigraphic concept, the supply generated sequence boundary, and I'll wrap it up with some modern analogs and in a depo model. Okay, so the ocean is much, much larger than the biggest lakes by some three to four orders of magnitude. Uh, its volume changes depend on global processes, whereas lakes are influenced kind of locally to regionally. Now we can see this by comparing volumes of the oceans uh, and the surface areas uh, of the oceans and the largest lakes, as you can see on the left, notice the log scale, uh, but also by looking at their respective base level changes. So if you look at the bottom right figure, um, that shows kind of yearly fluctuations of global sea level, which happens on the millimeter scale, as you can see. Um, but if we look at these two lake graphs, uh, starting with the Great Salt Lake up top, uh, we can see about 15 meters of water level fluctuations in the last century and a half. And Lake Baikal in Russia right here, which shows a range of about five meter fluctuations since the mid 90s. So this difference can and does drastically change the depositional stratigraphy between the two systems. So if you're not a sedimentologist, you're probably averting your eyes in horror right now, but I, I'll be brief. Um, conventional sequence stratigraphy was created sort of as a predictive schema for continental margin sedimentation patterns. Um, you can kind of think of it as when sea level lowers drastically, deltas prograde uh, or move forward towards the ocean, eroding into the now exposed continental shelf. And it's that erosional surface which can be considered a sequence boundary and let sedimentologists know that a sea level fall occurred in the deep past. Um, eventually the sea level rises and the deltas get drowned, forcing the system landward. 
So the one thing to take away from the slide is that regional or large scale erosional surfaces and continental margins are inferred to be caused more often than not by sea level fall with an implicit argument that sediment supply is high enough to kind of cause delta progradation. Now, I know this is, this is basic. Uh, the reality is much more nuanced. But importantly, this was the logic which previous interpreters of my outcrop were working under. Uh, and that's the fact that um, lake level or sea level fall precipitated um, the kind of driving of the uh, progradation of the system. So keep that in mind. Um, now the geologic background slide. Uh, the outcrop correlation I'll be showing you comes from the southern margin of the Uinta Basin in the Middle Green River Formation. So the Uinta Basin is here in northeastern Utah, outlined in red. Um, it's paleogene in age and has acted as a long-lived sink of continentally drained sediments that were likely sourced from the still advancing at that time uh, severe thrust front. And the lake during the early Eocene was semi-arid to subtropical and exhibited a range of lake levels. Uh, as you can see here, here's kind of the regional strat column with our Cretaceous foreland basin sediments down here, and we're going to be in this middle Green River formation. I'm going to zoom in on this little area here, uh, which our outcrops are in, uh, these two canyons. Um, but first, I want to show you kind of a quick overview of the regional stratigraphy of the Uinta Basin with some rapid fire photos. So here you can see kind of the entire basin dipping towards this northern uh, footwall. And our outcrop is going to be in the kind of upper half of this red outlined section. And what it does is it shows kind of several alternating packages of sandstone, lacustrine mudstones, and carbonates. Um, you can kind of see that schematically shown here where these M markers are going to be carbonates that are used as uh, correlatable horizons. Um, so I'm going to be working um, with the kind of units and uh, nomenclature from Dave Keeley, um, who did work here in 2003. As you can see, here are some of his markers uh, that I just drew out. And they separate these kind of uh, channelized sandstone bench forming outcrops uh, from the uh, mudstone uh, slope formers. <coughs> um, Here's a picture kind of just without the lines uh, showing that these channels can be uh, anywhere from a meter to 10 meters in thickness. Uh, they can be incredibly laterally continuous um, or sometimes they can just stop, uh, you know, and you see the edges of the channel margins. Um, so this is about 200 meters here. Um, <clears throat> and Dave Keeley, the uh, guy that did this work, uh, a lot of this work in 2003, um, picked about 10 sequences uh, for this interval of 200 meters, um, or 10 cycles, from which he picked five sequences, excuse me. And you can see these here uh, with these boundaries drawn. And uh, I'm going to be focusing on these top three sequences. Uh, it's about 80 meters of section. And notice how he put his sequence boundaries um, below these kind of channels, right? So these these yellow sort of uh, semicircular things are channels, and he puts the sequence boundary below them. And that, um, and he used that to kind of infer that lake level drop um, was marked by the progradation of this system. So we actually believe this is incorrect, and I'll talk about it in a second. But here's my cross section or correlation panel um, of Nine Mile Canyon in the southern Uinta Basin. It uses some 22 logged sections, uh, some of which are mine, uh, about eight which are mine, and, and some of which are, are old or, or unpublished from, from the dynamic stratigraphy group. It traverses about 30 kilometers, uh, or three times larger than the previous panel I showed you, which kind of went from here to here. Um, so this is going to be a strike view, uh, maybe slightly oblique. Regional paleoflow, I'm sorry, it's not marked on here, uh, is about north to north northwest or so. And I'll spare you the monotonous facey slide, uh, but just know that the um, the yellow is large channels, the red is severely exposed floodplain with some pedogenesis. Uh, light blue is subaqueous clastics like pro delta silts, muds, cyan are these shallow water or uh, literal to sublittoral carbonates like grindstones and, and stromatolites occasionally. Uh, and gray, which you can't see probably here, is, is oil shale, so deep water carbonates. So we've actually repicked Keeley's three sequences as 10 um, sequences. And each sequence is importantly transgressive in nature. And it begins not with a regional unconformity, but with a regional increase in siliciclastic supply. And I'll walk you through this logic. 
So the main idea to wrap your head around is that accommodation and sediment supply are linked during times of stratigraphic formation. And that's because they both, water and sediment, must enter the lake basin through the same conduit, which is local tributary rivers. Now, other forces like evaporation can modulate the base level kind of independently, but the only way to build stratigraphy in these systems is to increase both the water and clastic influx to the basin, making these sequences inherently transgressive and almost entirely supply generated. So on the left-hand figure, I show an example where in figure C, the supply generated sequence boundary uh, goes, uh, goes between the former low supply carbonate faces and the scouring channel above. So this kind of looks like a conventional sequence boundary. Uh, but in figure D, we see the supply generated sequence boundary in between a conformable contact between two low energy faces, carbonates from the previous cycle and red pedogenic floodplain mudstone. So this sequence boundary reflects still a regional increase in supply, but one that was lateral to this uh, fluvial axis. And as you can see, the kind of sediment supply and lake level curves, while not in one-to-one -one correspondence everywhere, do show kind of this concomitant increase in sediment supply and water level during the creation of the large portion of the stratigraphy. So we can think kind of on here as the right as uh, you know one cycle or one sequence as being uh, where we have high lake level with little supply, which favors carbonate formation. And then the lake level falls still under low supply, exposing the carbonates at the surface. And we have evidence for this. Uh, Eventually, under a high supply regime, uh, the lake level and uh, the lake level begins to rise, and we have water influx and sediment influx, creating stratigraphy. Um, finally, supply drops off, but lake level remains high. You get carbonate deposition repeating the cycle. Okay, and that's all well and good, but what is the forcing mechanism? What modulates kind of sediment supply so consistently? Remember, we have you know. Uh, a bunch of alternating cycles of this uh, sandstone, mudstone carbonate. Um, so the answer we think can be found in recent work on the early Eocene hyperthermal regime. And so in the years between the Paleo-Eocene thermal maximum, the PETM, and the early Eocene climatic optimum, or the EECO, there were these 40,000 year bouts of kind of intense climatic warming, which occurred with highly variable storm surges, wide-scale flooding, and aridification, as well as enhanced weathering. In between these times were kind of these cooler, wetter, more consistently subtropical temperatures. And you can see kind of uh, these pinkish salmon colors uh, show uh, times of, of hyperthermal, basically, events. And this kind of blue line shows uh, where our study interval kind much. of should be. Thank you. Um, so Lauren Bergenheyer at the University of Utah showed that kind of these large channelized sandstones in the Sunnyside interval are associated with these negative carbon isotope, uh, negative carbon 13 isotope excursions, pegging them to these regional hyperthermal pulses. Um, and so we believe that the pulses of extreme weather were kind of the genesis of these supply generated sequences. Now, indeed, when we take the 10 sequences that we have in this correlation panel, and here they make up about 40 to 50% of the entire stratigraphic interval. Remember, it's about 200 meters. Uh, this is anywhere you know, from 80 to 100. Um, so, but if we extrapolate the number of sequences, we'd result in about 20 to 25 sequences throughout the entire section. Um, this agrees with both the average sequence thickness that we calculate at about eight meters and the timing of hyperthermal pulses. So tentative age ranges for the entire interval are around 1 million years. One left. That divided by 20 to 25 leads to about 40 to 50,000 year sequence durations, which really buttresses the argument for supply generated sequences. So I wish, uh, like you heard, I had more time to talk about the system and its possible analogs. But the important takeaway is that the system likely acted as a small, low discharge, perennial local fluvial delta during interhyperthermals with a lot of carbonate shoal formation. Some kind of intermediate system um, or, or a terminal splay kind of during the low supply, low lake level, early hyperthermal periods, kind of like this one. Um, and then this kind of middle uh, sort of system with high discharge uh, as the lake would fill up. Um, we, can we can kind of characterize this as a supply generated splay delta, which exhibited a wide range of bedding geometries and facies patterns, depending on the regional climate that was influenced by these early Eocene hyperthermal events.
so with that, I'll give thanks to the Jackson School, Rio, the Rio Mar Consortium, and uh, my committee, Cornell, Ron, and, and Brian. So thanks. Thank you very much, Jake. Um, so that is uh, time. So we unfortunately don't have questions, uh, time for questions right now, but if you are available, Jake, at the very end of this session, um, that might be a great time to field questions. Sure. Um, so I'll turn it over to Rebecca to introduce our next speaker. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, our next speaker is John Fanny. Um, so uh, I'm asking uh, Chip to make a short introduction of John Fanny. All right, thanks, Rebecca. So good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, Tim Meckel, Senior Research Scientist at the Bureau of Economic Geology, Gulf Coast Carbon Center. Um, Today I'm introducing John Franey, uh, who was uh, a native of, of Corpus Christi and actually attended UT Austin Geosciences for his undergrad degree, uh, where he started working as an undergrad research assistant for the Gulf Coast Carbon Center. Uh, we had John working with a lot of logs and um, doing some help with uh, data uh, manipulation. And when John expressed an interest in continuing on for a master's degree, it was really natural because he he was uh, he understood what the center was trying to do and what data we had available. So um, uh, today he's going to talk a little bit about some integrated seismic interpretation and techniques that we've been developing for looking at storage of CO2 in the near offshore region. And um, after uh, uh, John will be this summer interning with EOG in Denver. So the floor is yours, John. All right, uh, thanks, Tip. Uh, I think everyone can see the screen and hear me. So uh, as Tip mentioned, my name is John Franey, and today I'll be presenting my work on developing a high-order stratigraphic framework for intraslope growth faulted subbasins offshore of Matagorda Bay. Uh, this map on the right shows my study here outlined in this orange box. As you can see, we're working in the state waters offshore of Matagorda Bay, uh, which is just south of Houston. And before I get started, I want to mention how exciting it is to be working in the realm of carbon storage in Texas waters. Uh, the green dots on this map are active site characterization projects for the purpose of carbon storage. Uh, the Carbon Center here at UT has worked on many of these projects, so my work is really a continuation of these efforts just further south along the Texas coast. Okay, so there are two main questions or goals my uh, research is attempting to answer. Uh, the first is to develop a high resolution mapping of potential carbon injection intervals for the purpose of risk assessment. Uh, anyone here who's worked with oil and gas exploration knows that there's several geologic elements that can be risked to determine the viability of a well site. Uh, so my work is focused on understanding the thickness and extent of shales in the study area and their ability to act as a seal for injected carbon. Uh, the second question is a little broader, but we're trying to see if the findings in this relatively small study area uh, can be applied to similar structures along the Texas coast. Uh, so before showing off what I've been working on for the past two years, I want to briefly touch on carbon capture and its purpose. So as I'm sure we all know here, the amount of greenhouse gas we've been releasing to the atmosphere has been rapidly increasing over the past 100 years. Uh, many governments and industries see this as an exponential threat that requires our immediate attention. And so one of the leading ideas to transition to net zero emissions is the use of carbon sequestering to offset our current emissions. Uh, so the figure on the right is a simple cartoon of what a carbon storage reservoir would look like. Uh, the first thing to point out is the depth requirements for carbon storage. So we must inject beneath the supercritical depth. Uh, this is the depth at which CO2 becomes a supercritical fluid. Uh, it's more dense and becomes more efficient to store. So that is this green dashed line in this figure. Uh, the red dashed line is the overpressure depth, and here we must worry about reservoir integrity while injecting CO2. Uh, so we're lo really looking for this Goldilocks zone between these two depths. Uh, so also in this figure, we can see the well injecting to the CO2 into a porous reservoir rock. Uh, it's being trapped by this fault and then has this shale pop seal. So it's this sealing shale interval that my work is focused on. Okay, so with that background covered, let's go into the uh, study area. So again, we're just offshore of Matagorda Bay, Texas. The image on the right is a seismic structure map of the study area. And I really wanna draw your attention to these half oval shapes consisting of the cooler colors in the structure map. 
Uh, so these are the subbasins which I'll be dis discussing. Uh, so I named each of the subbasins according to the nearest onshore uh, body of water. And then on the left, we can see the strike image from A to A prime, left to right. And in this strike image, you can really start to see the structure of these subbasins. We have this series of anticlines and uh, synclines. So we believe that each of these subbasins has the potential to act as a carbon storage site based on the structure, high quality sands, their depth, and their location uh, relative to onshore CO2 production sites. Uh, okay, I'm going to quickly walk through the structural history of these subbasins. Uh, so, in fact, they link all the way back to the Jurassic, during which the Luan salt was deposited. Uh, this salt covered a massive swath of the northwest Gulf of Mexico and extended further east. And uh, through the Cretaceous and Eocene sediments were being deposited atop the salt, uh, they experienced some gentle folding. And this either occurred through gravity-driven folding occurring at the toe of the slope, or from far field stress from the subduction of the Pacific plates underneath the North American. Uh, I want to emphasize that there was no major tectonics occurring here, just some really gentle folding of the sediments. Uh, at the same time, the salt formed an aloctonous salt canopy across the sediments. And so this results in areas of locally thin salt and areas of locally uh, thick salt, uh, which is reflecting the underlying sediments. Uh, now, by the Oligocene, sediment influx has really increased from pulses of the Laramide, and these newly deposited sediments caused an evacuation of the salt. Uh, the sediments then collapsed to fill the newly created void space. Uh, so where the salt was once thick, there was more void space, and we get a subbasin. Where the salt was once thin, there was less void space, and we get those anticlines between them. Um, so now that we understand how we have a suite of such similar structures that formed along the Texas coast, uh, we want to understand the stratigraphy within the lower Miocene 2 interval. Uh, so the strat column on the left shows the interval of interest denoted by this red box here. Uh, so it's this large third order transgression between the AMP B and Margulina A biostratigraphic markers. Uh, the seismic line on the right is the same strike line as we saw earlier. And we have three of the subbasins labeled and the interval that we'll be investigating again denoted by the red box. Uh, so again, I'm looking to piece together the fourth order stratigraphy to develop an accurate understanding of shale thicknesses and their distribution to aid in ris uh, risking these sites for carbon storage. And we're also trying to determine how similar these shale intervals are between each of the subbasins uh, to see if that can be used as a basic assessment for subbasins further up and down along the Texas coast. Uh, so how do we go about this like high resolution interpretation? Uh, so there's two tools that I use to aid in this interpretation. Uh, the first is called a dip steered seismic volume. So looking at figure A in the bottom left, uh, we can imagine this is our seismic survey. And so a dip steered seismic volume is the calculation of the dip of a seismic event in both the inline and cross line direction. Uh, so this occurs at every inline, cross line, and seismic sample, which in our case is every four milliseconds. Uh, essentially, this creates a sparse matrix of dip vectors that can be used as weighting parameters for a variety of calculations, uh, ranging from interpolation or seismic attribute generation. Uh, so a simple example of how this works are in figures B and C. So imagine we're trying to calculate a discontinuity attribute. Uh, this is basically asking how similar is one wiggle trace to the wiggle trace right next to it. Uh, so figure B shows a simple example of this. The red line would be the time we're conducting this calculation. So visually, if we compare one wiggle trace to the one next to it, uh, we would say this is highly discontinuous. Uh, but now looking at figure C, we can do the same calculation, uh, but this time apply the dip vectors to the red line. And so this like bends the red line and it better reflects the underlying geology. And suddenly this interval seems much less discontinuous. Uh, so the way I use these dip vectors is to create something called a horizon cube. Uh, this is a dense set of 3D auto tracked horizons. And because we have a dip vector every four milliseconds, we can generate horizons at a much finer resolution than traditional seismic reflectors. Uh, so this can be seen really well on the image of the right. So this larger image shows about 20 to 30 seismic reflectors, but they're populated with over 500 horizon cube intervals. And the possible resolution can really be seen on this inset image, uh, where we have a single seismic reflector populated by over a dozen intervals. So again, these intervals were interpolated uh, with weights determined by our dip vectors, 
And each of these smaller intervals can be assigned different and unique properties, which allows for this high resolution model of the area. Uh, so these techniques really allow us to bridge the gap between high resolution but sparse well logs with low resolution but continuous seismic data. And finally, the image on the bottom right is a little movie showing the 3D aspect of the horizon cube intervals. Okay, so with our data and tools created, we can move on to the fourth order interpretation. Uh, this seismic line is a dip line running through the center of the Matagorda South subbasin. Uh, the left hand side is landward and the right hand side is basinward. So for each interpreted subbasin, we had 10 to 20 well logs with an associated SP curve. Uh, these well logs were correlated with each other and the seismic data. Uh, we then picked fourth order sand and shale intervals. Uh, also using the well log and these horizon cube intervals. Uh, in this image, the sands are yellow and the shales are brown. And again, these colors that you see on the seismic interval are those horizon cube intervals that have been populated with this data. Uh, so I really wanna draw your attention to this top shale interval within the seismic. So we can see it tied to the high SP response to the log. And as we move basinward, we see some extreme thinning within the shale. So in fact, the shale is thinner than the seismic reflector. And this is really the powerful aspect of this method. So mapping this thin shale wouldn't be possible without the workflow presented here. And this better reflects the true thickness of the shale. And this is immensely important for an accurate risking of CO2 storage. Uh, before injections, we need to be sure that the CO2 will stay within the reservoir and not break through a shale that's too thin. Uh, so here's a sample of the resulting data after completing this workflow. On the left is a thickness distribution of shale intervals only from well data. So we have 12 discrete data points and a rough understanding of the thickness distribution, but no insight to its spatial variability. So after using the dip steering data and the horizon cube of the area, we have the resulting images on the right. As you can see, our thickness distribution is much more filled out with over 35,000 individual samples and we have a better understanding of the variance of our data. Uh, we can also generate thickness maps from the to see the spatial variability of the data. Again, very important for risk assessment of CO2 injection. So this methodology was done for each of the subbasin and each sand and shale intervals, so resulting in over 30 of these distributions and their associated maps. Uh, so now I kind of want to walk through a quick example of how this data can be used in terms of risk analysis. Uh, so here we have two shale intervals, uh, both with the potential to act as a carbon storage. Uh, but say, for the sake of this example, we can only inject beneath one of them. Which one has less risk? Uh, well, if we were just using well data and basic seismic correlation, uh, we would have a rough understanding of their median thickness. So this histogram on the right shows that interval one, this pink interval, has a median thickness that's 60 feet thicker than interval two, uh, this green interval. So knowing only this, we would say that interval one has less associated risk and that should be the one injected beneath. But after high resolution analysis and mapping of the shells, we get a different story. As you can see from the thickness maps on the left, uh, interval one has areas of extreme thinning within the center of the subbasin, while interval two has much more uniformly distributed shales. Uh, so I believe that this would change the associated risk as a seal is only as good as its weakest point. So this high resolution mapping shows that interval two, in fact, is more favorable to inject beneath. Um, the final aspect I wanna to touch on before I close is the similarities between each of the subbasins. So here are three, thank you. Here are three distributions between three of the subbasins comparing similar intervals across each of them. Uh, for example, the deepest sand interval in each of the three subbasins here, or the shallowest shale interval between each of the subbasins. Uh, the colors in the distribution match these color rectangles on the map to show you which subbasin. So you can see in some cases, these distributions line up quite nicely, and in other cases, they're fairly disparate. Uh, and you'll notice in each of these, it seems that the green distribution is the odd man out, which is the Colorado subbasin. And rather than this being a result of a different sediment fill or uh, something along those lines, I think this can be explained by the geometry of our seismic survey. So if you notice the arrows on the right, we can see that the trend of the subbasins represented by this orange arrow is different than the edge of our uh, seismic survey. So as we move north, we image more and more of each of these subbasins. Uh, so I believe if we could image more of these southern subbasins, we would see their distributions conform to this green one uh, to better represent how these subbasins have very similar sediment fill.
So mm -hmm. despite some despite some of the variability and thickness that across each of the subbasins, the overall stratigraphy uh, between them implies that subbasins further up and down along the Texas coast can also act as carbon reservoirs. Uh, so to wrap this up, uh, using these geophysical techniques of dip steered seismic data and horizon cubes have proven useful and necessary to assess the, sail, uh, the shale sealing capacity within these subbasins in Matagorda Bay. And extreme thinning of shales is always a risk in CO2 injection. So we need to be sure we have accurate uh, understanding of these thicknesses uh, to uh, mitigate this risk of leak. Uh, finally, this region should be further considered for uh, carbon storage potential. So with that, I'd like to thank my advisor, uh, Dr. Meckel, my committee members, the Carbon Center Department DOE for sponsoring it, and SEI for providing the seismic data. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, John. Uh, we haven't seen any questions here. So we can move on to the next speaker. Yeah. Perfect, yeah. So our, uh, just as a reminder, um, the audience is welcome to type uh, questions in the chat or in the Q&A box in the control panel, and we'll bring them up after the talk. And then if we don't have time for the questions at the end of the talk, we can, uh, the speaker can field those questions at the end of this session. Uh, and students also um, need to vote for the best talk, and there's a call for site on the Master Saturday website to do that. All right, so our next speaker is Fernando Ray, and I would like to invite his mentor to introduce him. Yes, good, thank you. So uh, Fernando Matias Ray, he uh, did his undergraduate in uh, Buen University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Uh, after that, uh, Fernando worked for years with YPF, the National uh, uh, Petroleum Company in Argentina. And then uh, he started, uh, well, two years now, uh, a master's uh, degree at uh, UT Austin, uh, being on a Fulbright scholarship uh, from Argentina. And he will uh, talk today about uh, uh, a Pliocene Colorado Delta uh, in the Fish Creek Balacito Basin. And uh, he, his uh, novelty is that he, he's working on something uh, um, called double clinoforms, deltaic double clinoforms. Um, and it's the first uh, uh, attempt to prove this into an uh, uh, ancient deposit of Paleo Colorado. Fernando? OK, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, you're good. Excellent. Hello. Uh, today, I will, I mean, my name is Fernando Ray, as, as Cornell said. I am a second year student here at Jackson School, and today I will present you the anatomy of deltai compound clinoforms uh, with examples from the modern Colorado Delta and uh, the ancient Pliocene Colorado Delta at California. First, I would like to uh, introduce the concept of compound clinoforms, which are a common morphology present in major rivers around the world and they consist in two clinoforms, one over the other. The upper one called shoreline clinoform, which is uh, about 10 to 15 meters uh, high. And then another one, which is way more uh, bigger, which is 30 to 100 meters high, which is called subaqueous clinoform. Between the two, we will have a zone of rework and bypass called subaqueous platform, which can have between 10 and 150 kilometers uh, of wide. That uh, variety is given by the amount of sediment that the system received and the strength of the shallow marine processes, which govern the distribution of sediment into the, into the system. The other very important uh, <laughs> concept I, I need to introduce you is that in this kind of system, we will have two high points and uh, high energy points one related to the shoreline clinoform called shoreline rollover and which is controlled mostly by fluvial processes and the other one called subaqueous rollover which is mostly controlled by shallow marine processes this is an example of a, a, a modern a compound clinoform in the Jacques El Arab uh, river in 
the frontier be between Iraq and Iran in the Persian Gulf, where you can see the two rollovers, the shoreline rollover and the Subacus rollover here in the in the profile, and in between the Subacus platform. This uh, Subacus platform is about 100 kilometers in this place. The opportunity that, uh, as, as Cornell said, the opportunity that present this job is that uh, we know the, that complete corner forms are present in modern examples, but we have little uh, example from the ancient. So the way that we are going to do uh, this, uh, explain this uh, concept is first we discover a modern, uh, in the modern Colorado Delta here, a compound line of our geometry. And then knowing that uh, we have the, the windows formation in the fish kit by Jacito Basin in this location, which was formed by the same river, but during the Pliocene with similar setting, uh, and it has been barely studied in, in previous papers, we have the opportunity to use this analogy to understand uh, how the ancient compound clinal forms deposits are organized and to improve the knowledge about the, the windows formation in general. First, I, I would talk about the modern Colorado Delta. The modern Colorado Delta is a tight dominated delta with tidal range of about 10 meters uh, high. And uh, this is because the funnel shape of the Gulf of California enhances the, the forces of the tidal, the tidal uh, currents and also uh, hinder the, the, the power of the waves. So that makes this uh, delta a very powerful example of tidal dominated deltas. Also, when we, there is another concept I would like to introduce is that in the subtidal zone, we will see that uh, there is this. Uh, features of elongated positive relief features as you, as you can see here when we do some cross sections we will see that they show as an asymmetrical shape and they are a bit of oblique from the direction of the paleo current uh, of the currents of the tidal current so uh, that allow uh, authors like alvarez to 2009 to uh, into to interpreted them as tidal bars. This is important because we will see some deposits in the ancient which will be similar to, will share some similar characteristics. Also, as you can see in this profile from the Colorado, from the Colorado Delta, which is there, you will see that we have the shoreline climate from here, we have the Subacus plant from here, and we will have the Subacus climate from here. So we have a compound climate from in this. Then I would want, like to introduce to the second part of this project, which is the it's located in the Fitchkit Rajasito Basin. Here is a recreation from the Pliocene and the and now nowadays, as you can see, the settings of the of the, this uh, delt uh, of this uh, basin was similar to the one in the present. And this fish kit Rajasito Basin is a small basin associated to the boundary between the North American Plate and the Pacific plate and has been filled by 5.5 uh, kilometers of sediment in a time lapse be between the Miocene and the Pleiocene, Pleistocene. We are going to focus in the lower Pliocene where the, the Winos formation was uh, deposited and mostly in the upper part of the Winos formation in the Yuha and Kamahad members. We are going to work in this area which is this is this and this is that. So let me show you. So in this map, it's important to emphasize that the north is towards the right, okay? Uh, in this research area, we measure four sections uh, marked in black, and we use uh, to correlate them uh, uh, coarse grain and ridges, which were easy to follow uh, around all the outcrop. We follow them by foot, of course, but using also uh, satellite images and drone photos. And we also measure 100 paleocurrents, which were consistent towards, uh, with the pattern consistent towards the south, so towards the left, which is, it makes sense because it does the direction of progradation of the Colorado, of the Colorado Delta now and in the Pliocene. In this four section, in this four section, we interpreted seven association of phases. We're going to start first with the lower UHA member here, 
uh, in this part of the outcrop we saw a consistent pattern which repeat and repeat itself of these three association of phases. First, always begin with 10 to 30 meters of structural mud stones. Then, it continues with 5 to 10 meters of rhythmite. And then, it finishes with 5 to 15 meters of coursing in our sequences, uh, which were going from uh, ripples and bitrubated sandstones towards a uh, coquina bed with a low angle process certification. In the coquina bed, we saw some uh, accretional surfaces which were uh, pointed to a different direction than the if the, the paleocurrence measured in the same beds which was a bit oblique that that uh, that's one of the the clues that allow us to interpret them as tidal bars so our interpretation of these sequences first we will have outer mass stone belts then outer subacus delta front and then the tidal bars. Then as we move up into the sequence, we reach the limit between you and camel head member. We are here in yellow, where we will have different kind of uh, uh, deposits. First we will have uh, we will have these two related. Uh, the, the first part is uh, 5 to 10 meters of laminated sealstones and sandstones with bioturbation, which inter interpreted with this uh, 5 to 10 meters of lenticular sandstones with ripples and cross stratification with these very nice mud drapes. We interpreted these two as first seals and hydrolytic banks and these as tidal channels. Uh, as we move up into a sequence now into the camel head, we will see uh, some sort of the same kind of pattern, but the way it's going to vary in three characteristic differences. The first one is that the amount of fine material uh, is going to decrease. The second is that this fine material is going to become more reddish. And the third is in this uh, channelized bodies, we are going to start to find petrified good. This petrified, these three uh, clues are giving us first that this is a much more proximal environment, then that this has water exposure. So that allows us to interpret them as tidal floods and distributary channels. So knowing the interpretation of the seven associational phases, we group them into three environments. First, uh, we have a subacus forcem and bottom set, which is the lower and middle part of the subacus clinoform which will be made by the uh, structural mudstones the, from the outer mudstones uh, belts and the outer subacus delta fronts, the rhythmites, okay? Then we will have the upper part of the uh, subacus clinoform and the lower part of the shoreline clinoform into this uh, subacus top set and platform. So we will have in the outer part, the tidal bars, and in the, low, in the, in the inner part, uh, seal, the silt and hydrolytic bel belts with some tidal channels. And then in the upper part, we will have this shoreline clinoform, uh, more like the upper shoreline clinoform, where we will have these distributary channels and some of these tidal floods. So, what we are going to have uh, uh, at the end will be these two coursing upward cycles, one over the other. So, then uh, to know a bit more about the, the architecture and the cyclicity, we used a four measure section and we correlated them using the reaches and then put Two into minutes. the, yes, I, I put into the environment. Uh, and what we measured there was the regression transgression uh, sequences, uh, sorry, 22 regression transgression sequences, about 25 meters thick with some lateral changes. And then we group those uh, cycles into four sequence sets of 120 meters thick. There is another uh, study of this area where they could measure a regressive, uh, a reversal of the magnetic, magnetos, magnetic, uh, geomagnetic uh, field. So they could uh, date this uh, UHA member and assign it to 190,000 years. So they could, uh, we could calculate it knowing the thickness that the accommodation rate for this interval was about 1.85 millimeters per year. So that allow us to know that the, this is a 
cycles were about 13,000 years uh, each, uh, interpreted as five order sequences, and the four sequences were about 66,000 years and interpreted as four order mm -hmm. sequences. So uh, then, as you can see, it's hard to see the two coursing upward cycles one over the other. And the reason behind this is that we are only working in a two, two kilometers uh, outcrop where uh, the migration of these, all these uh, the coupled kind of form is quite more bigger. So to end my presentation, I will uh, summarize the foundings in the, the in the evolution of the, the window formation. First, what we found that was that the lower Yoha member uh, was a, uh, was the prolongation of the subacus clinoform. We will have the tidal bars at the at the top of each cycle. Then we will have in the limit of between Yuhan and Kappelhead, we will have the prolongation of the shoreline clinoform, and then. In the upper camel head member, we will have only minor tidal influence and mostly a, flu a fluvial dominated environment. These are my takeaways. Thank you so much for your time, and I am open for questions. Thank you so much. Um, we are out of time for this. Uh, for questions, but uh, again, you can put your questions in the chat or in the Q and A, and we can address those at the very end of this at the very end of this session. Okay, um, I'd like to invite uh, Re Rebecca to um, introduce our next speaker. Um, hi, uh, thank you, congrats, Bonito. Um, um, every audience, please vote for a favorite one at the end of the session. Our first speaker is Jamie Ann Mokini Kurtz, and I would like to invite her mentor, Brian Horton, to please introduce her. Hi, my name is Brian Horton. Jamie Hertz is a native of Hawaii, whose interests in geology were sparked by her move to central Texas. She obtained her bachelor's degree in geology here at UT, and she has pursued an independent master's thesis uh, project that's addressing the uh, Precambrian evolution of the famous Belt Basin. Uh, her research has been centered on Glacier National Park in Montana and adjacent areas of Alberta, Canada. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jamie. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, my, yeah, like Brian said, my advisor, Brian Horton, um, my committee members include Ron Steele and Mark Helper. Our collaborators are Kirk Constanius and Victor Valencia, and today I'm going to be talking about the geochronology and sediment provenance of the Mesoproterozoic Belt Purcell Supergroup of Montana and Alberta, Canada. So just a bit of background, I'm going to be taking you guys to the Precambrian, where we're looking at the Mesoproterozoic time period at about 1.4 billion years ago. Um, and we're looking at the western margin of Paleo North America, which is actually centered here in um, modern day Idaho and British Columbia instead of Washington. And we have the Belt Purcell supergroup that records the deposition of about 10 to 15 kilometers of principally fine grain siliciclastic sedimentary sequences. Um, but some of the problems with the Belt Purcell is that there are uncertainties with regards to the geochronology and provenance necessitating a, re, a comprehensive reevaluation, um, which we will do to determine the stratigraphic age and depositional duration and accumulation rate um, using detrital zircon uranium lead geochronology, and as well as identify the sediment sources and dispersal patterns, and if there are, if and where there are any provenance shifts using an inverse Monte Carlo mixture model. Um, so this middle inset shows um, our study area within the Belt Purcell Basin here along the northeastern shore, and I have a 200 kilometer bar for scale there. And zoomed in on the left, um, we actually see that the majority of our study area is within Glacier National Park of Montana and Waterton Lakes National Park and Castle Wildland Provincial Park of Alberta, Canada. And we chose this area because it's spectacularly preserved within these parks. If you haven't been there, you should definitely go. Um, and our middle uh, figure shows a generalized geologic map that um, shows the we have the entire belt 
succession outcropping on both sides of this Lewis and Clark range, which has been translated 150 kilometers to the uh, northwest, or sorry, northeast along the Lewis thrust. And we have the lower belt to Rivali group, middle belt carbonate and Missoula group being orange, yellow, green, and blue. And on the right, our strat column shows that the belt per cell thins from about 10 to 15 kilometers in the depth of center to the southwest to about 4.6 kilometers here, which we, um, in our study area in the northeast. And I also, I've also listed the sample locations and positions within the stratigraphy um, of our samples 1 through 10, 27 listed from bottom to top. So um, now I'm going to start talking about the detrital zircon uranium lead geochronology and some of the methods that we do to get these um, uranium lead ages. So we collect a, a field sample and we extract the little zircon minerals from the rock um, through a series of mineral separation uh, procedures involving a um, jaw crusher and disc miller, a Wilfley water table, a Franz isodynamic magnet, as well as heavy liquids until all we're left with is this hopefully pure pile of zircon crystals. And we load these in a mass spectrometer um, that analyzes the both of these ratios of lead to uranium to calculate both ages. And if they agree with each other, we consider them concordant until we have about 120 ages per sample. Um, and we plot the, these are our geochronology results where the age, uh, um, the x axis is the age in millions of years from 1300 to 3500 MA, and the y axis is the number of grains determined to have that age. And here um, in the lower belt with samples, oh, I forgot to mention, um, we have 2558 analyses spanning our 27 samples, which makes this the largest belt, single belt geochron data sets to date. And um, in samples one through 13, which we'll call the lower belt per cell, we have these um, predominantly Osirian epic age grains from 1800 to 1920 MA being orange, as well as Sidurian to Ryacian ages being 1920 to 2500 MA in pink and Archean age grains from 2,500 to 3,500 MA in gray. Then moving up section, we have samples 14 to 18, which we'll call the middle belt per cell. Um, that is where we see the majority of our late Kalimian to early Kalimian age grains being 1480 to uh, 1340 to about 1600 MA being sage and red. And then the remainder of our strat column is almost exclusively late Stathurian to early Stathurian in grain age grains from 1600 to 1700 and 1700 to 1800 MA um, being blue and green. And um, we also see that the once dominant age peaks in the lower belt and middle belt have largely um, drastically diminished. And these results are reiterated by our multidimensional scaling plot. Um, where the axes are actually dimensionless, but basically it plots samples with similar age distributions closer together. And if they're dissimilar, they plot further apart. Um, and the lower belt denoted by A plots similar because they have similar age ranges and the upper belt plots closer together because they have these early uh, late Stathurian and early Stathurian age grains. But then um, when we look at the middle belt, they kind of plot all over the map where some plot closer to the lower belt and some plot in the upper belt, but samples 16 and 18, where we have these LC and EC grains, um, definitely plot dissimilarly from the rest of the belt. So we can take the geochron one step further and calculate the maximum depositional ages um, using detrital pi developed by Sharman et al. 2020 where we have depositions starting in the lower belt at 1490 MA and ending at the top of the belt at 1375 MA. And this gives us our basin age um, and also a depositional duration of 115 million years. Um, and also the accumulation rate here along our study area on the Eastern shore 
is about 5,000 meters in about 50 to 100 million years, which is 40 to 80 meters per million year, which is actually pretty slow. But if you consider the depot center in the southwest um, to be of the same age, and they do correlate with one another, then that means we have actually 15,000 meters depositing in about 50 to 100 million years and a rate of 150 to 300 meters per million year, which is actually incredibly rapid. Um, so, okay, that was the geochronology. And now I'm gonna kind of shift gears and talk about the provenance, starting with a qualitative assessment, um, where here, these are not samples that we've analyzed, but data that I've actually compiled from the literature, um, listed from top to bottom being clockwise from north to south from the belt basin. And here in the north and northeast, we see again the Sidurian to, um, I'm sorry, Osirian to Sidurian and Rhysian and Archean age grains, which is similar to what we saw on the lower belt. Um, and the east, which is almost exclusively Archean age grains. And I'll call this general north, northeast, east provenance direction, the Canadian shield. And then um, conversely in the southeast to south, this is where we see all of our late Kalimian to early Kalimian and late Stathurian to early Stathurian epic age grains, um, plus or minus some uh, Sidurian and Archean age grains. And I'll call this general Southeast, South Provenance, the Southern provinces. And um, it, the age distributions of these Southern provinces are similar to what we see in the upper belt. And this is reiterated by our multidimensional scaling plot where the lower belt A um, plots closer to the Canadian shield and the upper belt C plots closer to our southern provinces. And so this leads me to qualitatively be able to say that sediments for the lower belt are from the Canadian shield and sediments from the upper belt are from the southern provinces. So I don't just wanna uh, qualitatively say they're from the Canadian Shield or the summer, the southern provinces. I want to be able to specifically identify where our sediments are coming from. So I took this one step further and did a quantitative provenance assessment using this inverse Monte Carlo model um, de uh, called DZ Mix, developed by Sundell and Sailor 2017. And what it basically does is it tells me how much of each of the sources is necessarily to produce um, the mixed detrital sample that we have. And I've listed the Canadian Shield, uh, sources in the Canadian Shield as blue and the Southern provinces as red. And I have the model results for the cross correlation coefficient here on the right, where samples, um, uh, where the x-axis is the relative contribution from zero to 100% for each of the sources calculated for all one through 27 samples. And um, in the samples one through 13 being the lower belt, we see um, nearly 90, uh, 70 to 80% coming from the Canadian Shield, more specifically the Churchill province, the Sask Craton, the Trans Hudson origin, and the Mokovic province. But then in samples 19 through 27, we mostly have these um, Yavapai Mojave transitions, as well as Mojave Crustal province, um, being nearly uh, 80 to 90 percent of those samples. And so um, I just kind of re reiterated this in my conclusion figure where the lower belt on the left where um, mm -hmm. it shows okay where it shows deposition of the lower belt being from 1490 to 1450 ma um, where sediments are being sourced from the northeast to the belt Purcell basin and then in uh, during deposition of the upper belt where we which is approximately 1415 to 1375 ma we actually have sediments instead being sourced from the south to southeast. And we interpreted this to mean that they're um, to actually be the first instance of a continental scale reorganization of the drainage network 
during deposition of the middle belt, which was during the early Mesoproterozoic about 1.415 billion years ago. And this is analogous to work done by Blum, uh, Blum and Pekka 2014, which shows that um, in North America, there was a shift in the drainage reorganization where sediments that used to flow from the Appalachian to the Boreal Sea instead began to flow from the Rockies to the Gulf of Mexico as it does today. And One minute. Thank you. Um, these are our, the summary of my results today where um, we have the single largest belt per cell geochron data set. Um, we've reduced some of the uncertainties regarding the geochronology and provenance by calculating the basin age, depositional duration, and accumulation rate, as well as identify the source reason, regions, dispersal patterns, and kind of the overall implications of this study is that we have a massive drainage reorganization at 1.415 billion years ago. Um, and, the, and that sediments are not sourced locally, but are actually very regionally sourced. And um, yeah, some of my next steps involve identifying the tectonic setting and um, what that means for Columbia, Mesoproterozoic, Mesoproterozoic supercontinent reconstructions and what was connected to the Western margin of the belt Purcell basin and whether that was Antarctic, Antarctica, Australia or Siberia. And I'd like to thank these amazing people for all their help over the last two years. And if there's time for questions, I'll take questions. Um, thank you, Jenny. Uh, actually, there's a question from Dr. Charles Perrons. Great talk, Jenny. Any chance there was transport from the West if you reconstruct this North American plate like Australia? Like Australia. Um, any chance there was transport from the West if, um, yeah, it's possible, um, but I wanted to identify um, certainly the Laurentian sources first because our study area is along the northeastern shore of the belt. But if there are sediments in our study area sourced from the West, um, I'd likely think that they're in samples 16 and 18 because they plot so dissimilarly from the belt. Um, and that's also where we see age signatures um, that could be a non-North American source. So yeah, good question. That is um, certainly some of the next steps of my project. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, if we don't have any more questions, we recommend that the speaker stay the length of the session and be available during the break to uh, field and answer questions. Students will need to vote on the best talk and anyone who stayed for the whole session is encouraged to do so. Our project site has been set up for this and you can find the link on the Master Sexy website. Now please invite George to introduce the next speaker. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Joseph Sizdek, uh, and I would like to invite his mentor to please introduce him. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining in. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to introduce Joe Sidek. Uh, Joe was advised by Chris Som, which to me is kind of a second, uh, distant second. And uh, Joe came from uh, Illinois, from the Chicago Mafia and uh, Geology Mafia, and he's had a strong interest in structural geology. His advisor and Chris have a pretty close connection. So Joe came down to work uh, structural geology as it ties to reservoir systems working with uh, Chris and he's managed to do a really nice job of integrating <clears throat> kind of more classical structural geology with mechanical stratigraphy to come up with a, a great result on understanding distribution of, of strain within these systems. So take it away, Joe. Thank you, Charlie. And thank you everyone for joining in this morning. My research is looking into the mechanical stratigraphic controls on deformation in a fault propagation fold, an example from the Gobbler Anticline in the Sacramento Mountains of New Mexico. Folded carbonates comprise a significant portion of the world's hydrocarbon reservoirs, yet the prediction of strain within these reservoirs is problematic. 
We also know that when these systems are comprised of mixed lithophases, that this creates mechanical anisotropies between the beds and ultimately controls the intensity, style, and distribution of deformation. This is further complicated when characterizing subsurface reservoirs as typical subsurface data sets sample the system at varying scales and are not adequate to fully characterize the reservoir. Here's a graph illustrating that point with typical subsurface, subsurface data sets being core, well logs, and seismic imaging with this noticeable data gap when characterizing reservoirs. This is typically supplemented with outcrop analog studies. And here I have plotted where this study attempts to bridge this gap between subsurface data sets. Ultimately, the study aims to document the timing and orientation of a late Paleozoic structure, illustrate the relationship between fold geometry, internal deformation, and mechanical stratigraphy, and lastly, demonstrate the value of a, of a tightly constrained mechanical stratigraphic model for prediction of fracture distribution and fold geometry for analogous use in subsurface reservoirs. The figure on the left is a paleogeographic map from the mid-Pennsylvanian, specifically Desmoinian in time, and this coincides with the ancestral Rocky Mountain orogeny of the late Paleozoic, which formed a series of north-northwest trending basin and uplift pairs in the present-day southwestern United States. Here I have highlighted by this red box where the study area is located, and this was bordered to the east by the Paranal uplift and to the west by the Oregon Basin. This formed the narrow Sacramento shelf, which was dominated by carbonate deposition while also being influenced by the ice house climatic conditions illustrated by this figure to the right. So this increase in technism along with these high amplitude eustatic sea level fluctuations resulted in contrasting lithophases juxtaposed on one another and provides an excellent area to study the mechanical stratigraphic controls on deformation. Ultimately, to perform this study, we had to document the fold geometry, the internal deformational features, and the facies distribution throughout the section. Unfortunately, I can't go into detail on every single one of these uh, methods, but they all worked in concert in bettering our understanding of mechanical stratigraphy on deformation. Here's an overview of the study area, which is located in Escondido Canyon in the southern part of the Sacramento Mountains. We see this distinct cliff forming bench here, which is the bug scuffle limestone member of the Gobbler Formation. And this is the stratigraphic section which was utilized in the study. The bug scuffle was deposited on this homoclinally dipping ramp setting with the more distal outer ramp deposits consisting of thin bedded wax stones and mud dominated pack stones which are typically intercladded with clay-rich mudstone deposits. And then moving into the more proximal middle ramp setting, this deposited thicker bedded crinoid grain-dominated pack stones and grain stones. So with this depositional model in place, I was able to conduct these two measured sections um, by not only documenting the uh, lithophases according to the Dunham classification, but also be able to put it into its appropriate depositional environment. While also conducting these measured sections, I was able to test the unconfined strength or the mechanical competency of the rock with, uh, using an infield method with the Schmidt hammer. And this allows us to look at the unconfined strength of the rock and see how it uh, varies through different facies and depositional environments. And what we see with that is that the measured section taken at the gobbler anticline in this fold records 20% weaker on average rocks than this undeformed section. But what's most notable here is that this disproportional weakening of the wax stones between these two packages. And this could be pretty significant because these wax stones could be acting mechanically uh, different between these two sections, uh, such as acting as a, frac uh, a fracture barrier and uh, horizons for layer parallel slip to take place in the folded section. The figure on your top right is a virtual outcrop model processed with LIDAR from the USGS. And then down below it, I've traced out the major boundaries, formation boundaries, as well as overlaying this balance cross section. We document that the gobbler anticline is this north trending, doubly plunging fault propagation fold due to this blind, uh, blind basement rooted reverse fault. 
We also note a series of on echelon tear faults with central displacement, which create these secondary structures to the overall gobbler anocline. While also using the virtual outcrop model, I was able to trace out two key marker horizons, this lower one being the uppermost bug scuffle horizon, and this upper one being a key marker horizon in the Virgilian holder formation. We note this overall stratigraphic thinning adjacent to the forelimb of the anticline in the overlying Missourian uh, Beeman formation. And we also see that these on echelon tear faults that I mentioned briefly continue to cut across the overlying holder formation. So these field relationships indicate uh, timing constraints on uh, deformation with initial folding of the gabbler anticline likely occurring during the Beeman, uh, Missourian Beeman deposition and continued deformation post-dating the Virgilian holder formation. Uh, so some areas of interest that I'll talk about. First, I'm gonna talk about uh, two secondary fault propagation folds, which formed in response to the uplift on the master reverse fault and the on echelon tear faults. And then second is uh, these three areas of interest, which were utilized for a fracture characterization analysis. This first fault propagation fold formed on the western forelimb side of the gobbler anticline. We can see this tear fault cut across the lowermost exposed strata and lose displacement up section, which is accompanied by this bed folding that we see. I also have highlighted six different areas of interest which show these internal strain heterogeneities between these different facies. We see the more proximal thicker bedded deposits of grain stones and pack stones have a lot more distributed strain with large extension fractures and almost no stratigraphic thinning associated with the folding. This is contrary to the more distal deposits of thin bedded wax stones and mud stones, which have a lot more internal shear complexities and thin up to 80% when in, uh, involved in the folding process. The second fault propagation fold formed on the southern side of the exposed gobbler anticline. Um, and we broke this up into three different domains based on the structural mechanisms involved in each. This lowermost one, also blown up here, consists of tightly folded beds with multiple small scale thrust faults that quickly lose displacement up section. This is associated with the section with multiple uh, thin bedded wax stones and mud dominated pack stones, which are intercladded with these clay rich mudstone deposits. This allows for this. Uh, the, this package of rock to have multiple layer parallel slip horizons and accommodate this overall uplift and fold tightening at the hinge of this anticline. Now looking at this uppermost domain, we see this com uh, compartmentalized thrust fault with 20 meters of offset. And this section of rock corresponds to these thick bedded deposits of the pack stones and grain stones with a very uniform unconfined strength value throughout. We also note that there's a total lack of intercladded mudstones and wax stones here, which allow this package of rock to act as one mechanical unit and is subjected to this distributed strain through this thrust fault. So we see that it's not only this competency and astroscopies between the facies or the thicknesses of the beds, but also this relative abundance of competent versus incompetent horizons within a succession of rock, which work in determining the deformational mechanisms. And then lastly, is this fracture characterization analysis that we performed at three different areas based on the structural mechanisms involved in each. Uh, and this allows us this comparative insight on fracture development at varying scales of deformation. This low deformation area, as we've termed it, was conducted on the northern wall of Escondido Canyon with no evidence of significant folding or faulting associated with it. This intermediate deformation area was conducted at the crest of the anticline and incorporates the folding process of the anticline as the main structural mechanism acted on it. And then lastly is this high deformation area, which not only incorporates the folding process associated with the back limb of the anticline, but also these, uh, this fault damage zone, which formed in response to uh, these tear faults with the central displacement. <clears throat> 
So we were able to trace out these fractures and then uh, characterize them into this hierarchical scheme defined by the sequence stratigraphic architecture using a 1D stacking pattern analysis from the measured sections. And this hierarchy was uh, divided into four different classes, which include bed bound, cycle bound, sequence bound, and through going fractures. With this, we find an overall increase of fractures terminating at the sequence stratigraphic horizons of maximum flooding surfaces and sequence boundaries associated with more deformation area. We see 61% of the fractures terminating at these boundaries in the low deformation area and all the way up to 88% in the high deformation area. We also performed a curvature analysis at the crest of the anticline and typical study, uh, multiple studies had shown a positive correlation between uh, increased curvature and increased fracture intensities. Um, and this is a typical modeling attribute used for uh, subsurface reservoirs, but we show this weak positive correlation of 0.47 between the fracture intensity and the curvature of the anticline. And this is suggesting that the mechanical layering may play more uh, critical role on the development of fractures in, uh, in this area. We also see that this understanding the sequence stratigraphic framework for subsurface reservoirs might be able to provide this predictive insight into the fracture distribution. Ultimately, this study documents that the styles and extents of brittle deformation within the bug scuffle is clearly this link process between rock strength and the stratigraphic architecture. We find that wax stones are disproportionately weakened when involved in folding soon after deposition. Mechanical layering may play a more pivotal role in the development of fractures in more deformed areas. And lastly, that neglecting to incorporate the mechanical layering when modeling subsurface reservoirs will ultimately result in this poor strain prediction when compared to typical modeling attributes alone. And with that, I would just like to thank everyone that you see on this slide and all the organizations for the support of this research and uh, this excellent education that I've received in Austin. Thank you, and I can take any questions if we have time. All right, thank you so much. Are there any questions? Okay, not seeing any, uh, we will move on to our last um, our last speaker of this session. I do want to remind everyone that uh, all, all uh, attendees to Master Saturday are welcome to vote for the best talk on the Master Saturday website. Um, so if you go to the Master Saturday website and fill out the Qualtrics poll, you are well, welcome to vote for the best talk. So I'll turn it over to Rebecca Cow to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Josh. Uh, congrats, Joseph. Our last speaker in this session is Leon Sprangler, and I'd like to invite his mentor, Charles Karens, to please introduce him. Hi, Charles. All right. <clears throat> uh, well, it's a pleasure to introduce Leon Spangler. He is a native of Colorado, uh, and he's uh, from Colorado School of Mines, a great program there and came to us with an interest in paleoclimate, but also sort of an evolving interest in stratigraphy and sedimentology, and a very strong background in structural geology there from CSM. So we struggled a bit to find an initial project, but uh, Chris, Zom, and I working together with Leland came up with the idea of trying to better constrain timing of the ancestral Rocky Mountain system by tying into an area close to where Joe was working, just north of there in the Bursum group, uh, some formation sediments, which are sort of transitional Pennsylvanian Permian, which really helps us better understand timing of deformation in the broader Permian basin. So very interesting study and uh, take it away, Leland. Pleasure. Hi, Lee. And then you can speak now. Can you guys hear me now? Yep. Yes. Gotcha. Oh, awesome. Sounds good. Sorry, I got a little mixed up there. Awesome. Well, thanks, Charlie, for the introduction. Appreciate it. Um, this is uh, my uh, 
uh, study on the uh, timing and controls of late Paleozoic tectonism and synergenic sedimentation of the Bursum Formation, which is additionally in the Sacramento Mountains in New Mexico in uh, yeah, the United States. Awesome. So to run through kind of the, we have three main objectives uh, to this study. Um, the first objective here is to constrain the timing of the waning phase of some of the ancestor Rocky Mountain tectonism in the Sacramento Mountains and the Oregon Basin. Um, and this is an example from uh, Dickinson and Lawton that just shows uh, what they've used, you know, um, subsidence curves to approximate when a, that timing is, but we want to use some field relationships to try to pin that down a little bit closer. Um, objective two is to describe this understudied gap in the shelf to basin stratigraphy of West Texas and New Mexico. And then our third objective is to see if we can um, use these uh, relationships to suggest a broader control on Pennsylvania and a Permian deformation in the Oregon Basin region. And we're going to do that through uh, structural relationships and uh, development of a new stratigraphic framework, um, some provenance, paleocurrent and fault analyses, uh, synergenic stratigraphy, and then uh, we'll wrap back up and we'll uh, talk about how we uh, uh, approach these. So quick setting and geologic background, um, the latest Pennsylvanian through the earliest Permian is a really important time here in southern New Mexico and West Texas for basin evolution and infill. Um, what, where our study area is, is right here on the edge of the Orgron and Pedernal uplift. And if you aren't familiar with the, what the ancestor Rocky Mountain orogeny is, um, you know, you've probably heard of it, but it's uh, essentially at this time, you know, there's competing influences of both this uh, southern uh, Laurentian borderland and the Nevada and Paleo margin, which is considered the ancestor Rocky Mountain system, and then the Wachita Marathon Fold Thrust Belt, which additionally um, is uh, uh, happening around here at this time. Where our study area is, is right on the edge of the Pedernal Uplift in the Oregon Basin. So that's where, if we zoom in from this box to this box, we can see that uh, we're in this little red um, area right here. So we're right on the edge of a, a large granitic massif on the edge of the uh, western margin, or sorry, eastern margin of the basin. And if we look at that in uh, the str stratigraphy view, so a lot of these little black dots are uh, additional studies that have been, or outcrop studies that have been used to constrain the shelf to basin stratigraphy and not only the, the Delaware or Midland Basin, but what we have here is a gap between a lot of the uh, marine lower or uh, upper Pennsylvanian marine sediments and then some of the basal um, uh, Wolf Campion sediments that are uh, terrestrial. And so we have a big gap here that has is really been understudied and we're going to use some of the field relationships here to uh, explore that further. So our data set and methods, this is a pretty classic field study. So um, using traditional field methods, you know, geologic mapping, bed tracing. Um, but what was cool is we got to really apply the uh, drone models to this because the bursum formation, as you can see in figure B here, is characterized by there's a lot of cover. The beds are very discontinuous and, and, and hard to trace uh, laterally like, like you'd want to. And so using the uh, drone model, we actually got to you know, play with the color scheme and whatnot. And that facilitated a lot easier bed tracing for our measured sections, which we have GPS points for almost every single bed. So it made, it a, you know, made for a lot more robust stratigraphic framework than had previously been, been put together. So the structural setting here, so this is a geologic map of our study area. Um, and uh, what's really cool about this particular locality is the fact that we have these large ancestor Rocky Mountain structures that have essentially little to no laramide overprint. So this provides a really good opportunity to study those. They've been uplifted and tilted due to the Rio Grande Rift fault block, uh, uh, fault block uplift, and then exposed in the Sacramento Mountains and dissected by these large lateral canyons, which provide us a really you know, high resolution look at these. Um, so I'm going to clear your eye into a few key things here that are going to be um, very important for the rest of our study. If you look at B to B prime right down here, what we see are these large ancestor Rocky Mountain compressional features that are exposed to the surface. And this provides us an opportunity to, or a window to really see how these look. And then as they plunge off to the north in the subsurface here, we can see there's a few key um, uh, straddle and structural relationships that we're going to look at further. So one is the Alamo Fault, which plunges into what's called the Laluz Anticline right here, which is this bald, broad fault propagated fold. The Fresnel Fault, which propagates up to the surface here. And then the Dry Canyon Syncline, which is this downthrown basement block right here. And the Dry Canyon Syncline became this depot center that received bursum sediments across the Pennsylvania Permian boundary. And you can see this very thin blue line here that's approximately 93 to 115 meters, depending on where you are. That correlates to this blue um, uh, mapped out polygon right here that uh, has our measured sections on it highlighted in yellow. And so we're going to use these relationships right together to facilitate a deeper understanding of the synergic, synergenic nature of the deposit. So to, to um, pick this apart, really what we need to do, since this is a very 
classic sort of mixed carbonate siliciclastic or a true mixed carbonate siliciclastic uh, um, system, we have we we need to facilitate or we need to use these kind of end member depositional models to be able to correlate between our measured sections uh, a little bit better or fill in some of the gaps that we don't have. So um, what we can see is that there's actually two or these end members are essentially these two kind of um, uh, siliciclastic and then our carbonate uh, depositional system. One is this uh, alluvial fan depositional system that has uh, this subaerial exposure of you know, alluvial fans, uh, a fan delta braid plane that's above, right, again, um, uh, or subaerially exposed, and then the fan delta front and pro-fan delta facies. And that's kind of what this would look like an outcrop, you know, a very classic uh, uh, deltaic succession. And then our carbonate ramp depositional model here is uh, what's important to note about this is a couple of things. One is it's dominated by non-skeletal alichem. So we have a lot of, uh, for instance, incipient quartz cordwood grainstones right here, or rhodoids and oncoids. So again, lots of wave action, um, churning everything up. And it's very, you know, it's difficult for a lot of skeletal alichems to be able to, uh, to actually survive. Um, and then for instance, in this um, uh, uh, wood grainstone right here, we can see karsting and infill with, uh, um, quartz sand. And so that you know, highlights, again, how uh, uh, mixed the system truly is. And this is what that would look like in outcrops. So we see, for instance, oncoid redstone facies um, interbedded with these root grainstones, and then overlain by marine uh, sandstones and channel fill conglomerates. And we're going to talk about that in the next slide. All right, so here's our stratigraphic framework. And so what we're looking at here is x to x prime. So if we go back to that polygon in the, the previous on the map, this would be x, which is kind of distal, and then x prime, which would be proximal to a lot of these ancestor Rocky Mountain structures. And what's important about this is that this um, uh, helps us to uh, further subdivide not only the bursum, but also to show some of the stratigraphic relationships that occur due to uh, the active tectonism at this time. So the siliciclastics are dominantly in this kind of uh, yellow to orange scheme, and then the carbonates are in the, the dark gray to blue scheme. And what we can see here are a few key things. One is that we have a transitional, this is a, a transitional interval. So we're going from dominantly marine at the base up to more terrestrial at the top. The second is that we have um, alluvial fan, uh, fan conglomerates that are pushed out across the area that are likely being sourced from the Fresnel Fault. But what's also important is that following transgression of the marine system, we have establishment of the carbonate factory, which is then usually cut off abruptly by uh, and, and essentially suffocated by the siliciclastics that then rapidly flow in and essentially kill off the system. So we're going to take a look at this uh, in a little higher resolution here in a second. But what's important here uh, to also note is that we can subdivide these into packages, which then will help us um, uh, look at some of the synergenic uh, um, deposits here in just a moment, or synergenic uh, relationships. Let's see. All right, so what we did is, is uh, we did a couple more studies here. Um, one is we looked at some of the um, conglomerate compositions, uh, the paleo currents, and then some of the uh, fault slip directions, just to try to further constrain what some of the signals are that the bursin is receiving. So one here, uh, the conglomerates, um, we point counted these and we really ended up with kind of two end members. So one is these end members of conglomerates that are these large uh, carbonate conglomerates that generally have marine fossils from the middle Pennsylvania. So what that indicates is that they're being upthrown from some of the underlying blocks and then recycled and kicked out in the, the, the bursum area. The second is this end member that has increasing, uh, mo mostly metasediment, lithics, and chert, which indicates that there's some additional signal that's being sourced from the pedernal basement. And so, for instance, A would plot down here near the proximal to the Fresnel Fault, and then B would plot very distal to the Fresnel Fault. Uh, our paleocurrent analysis, basically, we uh, bend these into two uh, distinct um, uh, bins. One is uh, alluvial paleocurrents, which uh, the alluvial system you can see as a distinct uh, unimodality, which indicates that there's likely um, some confinement by active paleotopography at the time. So for instance, the braid plane along Steep Hill Road, Prey 29, and Cottonwood sections would be uh, essentially vectored down the, the forelimb of the Lollies Anacline, or, or uh, um, pushed out along the, the forelimb. Here, the uh, shore phase paleocurrents or, or other littoral sand bodies, we can see that there's a distinct bimodality, and that likely indicates you know, some sort of um, uh, marine uh, signal that and uh, a reorientation of the shore face from this kind of eastern uh, direction down towards the south. So potentially what we're really looking at here is more of an embayment rather than just a, a distinct shoreline that strikes you know, in one direction. 
Uh, finally, we did a fault slip analysis here. And what that indicates is we use just the, the fault planes and the uh, uh, plunge and trend and rake of the uh, uh, slick and lines to indicate that we actually have a right lateral oblique component to fault slip. And that became important. That'll be important later, but just keep that in mind. And then additionally, when we plot that up with these uh, idealized maximum compressional stress axes from an uh, additional study here, that indicates that we do have that oblique component to a lot of this faulting. And when we restore um, uh, our cross sections here, that indicates that we have about 2%, 2 2.9% uh, shortening from the zeolian to the acelian. So if we were to look at some of the contact relationships uh, in this uh, deposit here, we so we have uh, on the edge of the Lolly's anticline, What's cool here is you can see a 22 degree angular and conformity between the underlying holder formation uh, and then the basal bursum or the B1 uh, from our cross section there. And so what this indicates is additionally or, uh, is that the holder formation was uplifted and tilted prior to bursum deposition and then it was continuously tilted uh, post uh, B1 deposition. And what you can see here in a cumulative dip plot is that if we look at the stratigraphic level, each one of these little um, uh, sort of nick points would indicate that this is, uh, that there was a change in the uh, uplift uh, regime of the, the uh, forelimb of the, the fold. So from the B1 to the B3, you can clearly see it's being uplifted. And then from the B4 to the B7, essentially nothing happens. So what that likely indicates to us is that it was being uplifted into the B3 and then the rest of the slip was probably accommodated by the Fresnel fault at that time. The Fresnel fault provides us some really cool uh, straddle relationships to see the timing of when it was moving. So for instance, we have middle uh, to uh, middle Pennsylvania gobbler formation and Beeman shales that are deposited on the top. Beeman is uh, um, starting to move into the upper Pennsylvania, which indicates that, that the fault was not moving at Beeman time. But holder, it likely was moving into the holder, as you can see that some of the uh, um, uh, holder formation here is pretty chewed up in the foot wall of the Fresnel fault. But what's interesting is that the bursum mm -hmm. actually grows off of a lot of these folds. And so that puts a lower timing constraint for us on bursum deposition. And if we trace that up to the north, what we can see is that truncation by the uh, Wolf Campion Abo formation is, uh, uh, provides us with that upper timing constraint. So to summarize, what we can see here is that the um, carbonate factory of the bursum was periodically suffocated by an influx of siliciclastics, probably from the pedernal basement and then carbonates during deformation of the Fresnel. Um, oblique slip on the Fresnel fault probably reached a peak around the holder or B1 time. And contact relationships suggest that it ceased by the late, latest acelian. Contact relationships and growth strat on the forelimb of the La Luz suggest maximum contraction between the holder and the B1 time, which then ceased by the B4. And so if we tie that back to our original um, uh, goals here, we can see that the latest Pennsylvania or earliest Permian strata on the margin of the Oregon Basin was this pretty complex mosaic of this transitional marine to terrestrial sediment. Uh, the final resurgent phase of ARM faulting and folding along the pedernal front likely reached a maximum in the latest Virgilian and ceased by the latest Acelian as shown here by our little curves. But it's important to note that the um, previous figure I showed from Dickinson and Lawton was subsidence, not necessarily fault slippers, which is what we're constraining here. And additionally, this right lateral component might indicate that there's a greater influence from the southern Laurentian borderland than the Wachita marathons, but really it's very hard to uh, conclusively say that as we have, you know, there's a lot more study that needs to go go into to, you know, these kind of broader tectonic uh, um, studies. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oops. And thank you to, uh, yeah, special thanks to Charlie and Chris, and then uh, Brian Horton, Joe, and uh, everyone else in the RCRL.